All right. Uh, somehow you have to construct in the particular assignment of the first problem, you have to construct a tridiagonal matrix. Okay. So I'm going to just create a tridiagonal matrix and we'll talk about how to do that later on. Okay. So one way of manually creating a tridiagonal matrix is to actually enter the numbers that you have. For example, 2, 1, 0, semicolon, uh, 1, 2, 1, semicolon, 0, 1, 2, close parenthesis. Okay. So all I'm doing here is constructing a 3 by 3 tridiagonal matrix. This is not a very ideal way of doing it because if I have a 20 stage absorption column, I will have to enter 20 by 20 matrix. So how can we use MATLAB programming uh, structures to automate that process? Then as a process engineer, you will find that you can answer a lot of questions like what is the number of stages I need to achieve a certain separation? So those are the things we're going to do today. But to answer the first assignment problem, I need to create a tridiagonal matrix. There are a number of ways of doing it, and this is one. Having done that, then I want to go and look at that particular problem. What am I being asked? Okay. The first question is write a MATLAB function which accepts two inputs, S and N, and returns a tridiagonal matrix. Okay. That we need to do, but I will show you how to do that uh, later on. Using the values of S equal to 1 and N equal to 4, so it's a 4 by 4 matrix, do the following calculations in MATLAB. Capture all of your interactions in MATLAB using the diary command. That's the first thing that you need to know. Okay. What is a diary command? What does it do? Okay. <coughs> so if I say diary and then give it a file name, for example, A1. A1 is now the name of a file, and you, you must uh, begin to watch. There are many, many windows within the MATLAB environment. In this region, you'll find that there is a, a file structure, the trees. All the files that you create will be in there. Okay? And on this window on the right, you will see all the variables that you create. So that's a workspace. And at the bottom, you see a command history. Whatever commands that you have typed, it keeps a historical record of what you have done so that you can recall any of the commands. Okay? And uh, so when I say diary A1, it's going to create a file by name A1. You can see it there. A1 appears as a file. Okay? And the file is open. So whatever happens from now on between you and MATLAB session, a copy of it will be put in that file. It's a record of everything that happens. That's how one of the ways that you can submit your assignment, showing that you have done it by yourself. Okay? So you may want to put, for example, once you've done that, you can say my name or something that identifies you as the person doing that particular assignment. Okay? And anything that you put with a person sign in the first column becomes a comment. So MATLAB doesn't interpret it. MATLAB doesn't do anything with it except it will put a copy of it into that uh, diary command. Okay? So what do I have now? I have a tridiagonal uh, tri matrix, 3 by 3 matrix T, and I want to go through each one of those questions. Okay, I, I don't want to do it all of it, all of it here. Then you will just copy it and submit it. I'm just going to give you a few uh, hints on how to go about doing that. So the first thing is capturing everything. Then I say compute the determinant of t, and I give you use the MATLAB function det. Okay, so you need to know what is most important is for you to learn to learn MATLAB on your own. Okay, how do I learn MATLAB on my own? So you can type, for example, det help. DET. When you say help, give me uh, some help on that function, it will print out how to use it and what does it do. Okay. So DETX is the determinant of a square matrix X. Okay. So if you pass a square matrix X, it's going to calculate the determinant and return it. This you might have done it by hand for a 3 by 3 already. It's a long calculation. But in MATLAB, it's so easy. That's it. And a record of all this is kept in that file. And that's the file that you will later on. It's a text file. You can edit it. You can include it in your Word document if you want to submit it. You print it out and uh, submit that one as your the diary file as your uh, homework. Any questions? OK. Then I have to ask you questions. Compute the LU factor of t. How many of you remember what LU factor is? Nobody? Have you seen that or no? You've never seen that? Oh. Okay. I assume that a linear algebra course will cover all these topics. But if it, uh, if you have, how, how many of those you have not seen? Go through that list. 
Inverse, have you seen? Inverse of a matrix? Okay. Rank, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Okay. Orthogonality of eigenvectors, have you seen that idea? Uh, eigenvectors are perpendicular to each other. Okay. So, and polynomials, characteristic roots. Okay. So, the only thing that you haven't seen is the LU factor. Not a problem. Okay. So, what is an LU factor? Given a matrix, yeah. Pardon me? Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Exactly, exactly. It's a product of two triangular matrices. You can ask the question, if you give me a matrix A, can I always find these two matrices, the product of which gives me A? And it is like asking the question, if you give me a number 10, can I write it as a product of two numbers? Obviously, you can. And there are many, many ways of doing that. Okay? There's no, there is no uniqueness to it. And the same thing happens in matrices. So a matrix can be written as a product of two matrices. And there are many, many such factorization schemes. It's called a factorization scheme. QR factorization, LU factorization, etc. Now, in the LU factorization, because there are many ways of doing it, we use those degrees of freedom and say, I want these matrices to have certain properties. I want the L matrix to be strictly lower triangular. What does it mean? Only numbers below the diagonal are non-zero, everything above is zero. And the other one to be strictly upper triangular, meaning all the elements above are non-zero, non -zero, below are zero. So MATLAB, this is a very lengthy algorithm if you want to do it by hand. And in my textbook that I have put on the modal, you will find the algorithm. You will find the program that does it. Okay, the program that we ourselves write in MATLAB to understand how to implement something like that. But MATLAB has built-in algorithms for these. And that's where really the power of MATLAB comes. Excel, you cannot really do these things. You can define a matrix in the cells, but you cannot really do these calculations. In MATLAB, it is, uh, again, the first thing that I would say is try help LU and see what it says. Okay, And it tells you something about uh, how to input the variables and how to get the output from the variable. And this is a fairly long, lengthy help because LU factorization is a fairly long, powerful algorithm. So LUA, A is the matrix that you pass. A need not be tridiagonal. It can be any general square matrix. Uh, it stores an upper triangular matrix in U and a lower triangular matrix in L. Okay. So it's going to return. Remember, how does a function work? A function, LU is a function. It's a built-in function. A function is basically a rule. It takes certain inputs, applies those rules, and produces certain outputs. And we are going to learn how to write our own functions in MATLAB. Okay? But this is a built-in function which takes A and returns two variables, L and U. In fact, it returns more than that, L, U, P, L, U, P, et cetera. But for our purpose in this assignment, all I need is L and U. Okay? So the way to use that then, once I understand that part, um, remember, here, here also tells you Cholesky factorization, QR factorization. These are other factorizations that are available in MATLAB. So to use that, all I need to do is L, comma, U equals L U T. So T is already a matrix that is defined. Okay. So it is going this function is going to factor that matrix, give me the L and U. And you must watch also what happens as I type these on the workspace. On the workspace I have a variable called T, another variable called ANS. Where did that come? A and S. It is answer to the previous question which was the determinant. Okay. So what I should have done is I should have actually created another variable which I can understand because ANS is a single variable that will be overwritten. Every time you enter a command without a receiver for the output, it stores it in the variable called ANS. Okay. So there you have L and U. It returns the lower, factor, uh, uh, lower triangular factor and the upper triangular factor. Okay. Is that enough help for you guys? From that point, you can go and do the remaining part, right? Uh, what exactly is the diary command do? What did the diary command do? It is uh, I will. Sh it started recording everything that was happening. But when I say recording, it doesn't record the audio video. It records what happens on the screen, the command that I type, and the result that it produces. It keeps an identical copy of it in a file called A1. Now, I will say, for example, diary off. From now on, it will not put a copy of that into that file. I can type anything else I want. For example, D is equal to determinant of T. A copy of this won't be in that file. 
But if I want to restart it, I can say diary on. And then capture again, continue to capture what happens. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Ah, good question. What does clear do? You need to understand that. If I say clear, for example, all the variables that you see in this workspace are going to be wiped out. So now I don't, MATLAB doesn't know what T is because I've cleared it. But what happens in that file will still remain. Okay? The clear only clears the workspace. Workspace is different from what happens in the file. Okay, so I can go and open that file. And you see a copy of exactly what we did. Okay, my name, help determinant, determinant of this actually, the value is 4, help LU, everything is captured. You can go and edit it if you want, if you want to clean it up. For example, you did something wrong, it prints an error message, you don't want the error message in your submission, so you just delete it. Okay. Any questions? That should get you started with what I expect in the first problem. Um, other than reviewing actual linear algebra concepts. So there are the orthogonality. Yeah, question. Do we ever need to use the editor? Yeah, you will use the editor pretty soon. Uh, the editor is a nice way of writing your own MATLAB programs and functions. We will do that. So, yeah. All right. All right. That's what we are going to do. We are going to write a function that will take S and N, uh, or I'm going to do slightly differently, but I want you to do that part of the assignment. Uh, I will give the lower up diagonal and the upper diagonal, and then I will write a function that returns T. Yeah? Uh, yeah, print it out and turn it in, please. <laughs> we are still not yet <laughs> uh, advanced enough. Uh, to accept uh, online ones and the TA, the life is a bit hard for the TA, I think. So, any other questions, comments? <clears throat> okay, so give that a try, and you should remember, like the roots of the poly characteristic polynomial are also the eigenvalues of the matrix T. So those are the things that it tries to um, kind of review for you. Any other questions on the assignment? Yeah. What if you like mess up after using the diary and they have all the mistakes and stuff? So have, and the printout version has all these mistakes. You can go and edit it. It's just a text file. Oh, okay. You can go into, you can take, open that with a word processor and delete that or a notepad and delete that. So you can edit that if you want. Okay. Can I close this assignment problem? All right. Okay. That. Um, what were we? Did I close the lecture notes too? <coughs> okay. Um, in the last two lectures, we basically looked at development of a model for a stage wise process. And then the last lecture, Tom came and showed you MATLAB. Now, the purpose of giving you MATLAB tutorials from time to time is not to teach you how to do a particular thing, but the process of learning. Like, why would I cover how to write a function that calculates the exponential of some number? Okay, It's already built in. In MATLAB, I can go and calculate that. The purpose of doing that was to show you how to implement the while loop in there. Okay. So those are the things that you need to get, the more general abstract ideas in MATLAB and how you can use it to solve other kinds of problems. <laughs> I'm now going to examine you to write uh, a sine function. Okay. But do you, do you, have you thought about when you have a calculator and if you want to calculate the sine of something or exponential of something, you just enter the number and press the button sign and it gives you the value. How does it do it? a series expansion. Every one of these functions, exponential is a series, sine is a series, cosine is a series. Okay? So it takes enough terms in the series to give you accurate value up to 7 digits or 14 digits. Okay? The true value is actually an infinite series, so the infinite decimal places will be there. So the first thing that you need to understand in MATLAB or any computing environment is there is a finite precision. There is always errors when you're doing multiplications with numbers, particularly with uh, those kinds of uh, functions. 
in the stage-wise process model, we just took a three stage so that we can write down all the three equations explicitly and look at what the structure of the problem is. So there, are, there were 10 variables and there were six equations. So we said the degrees of freedom is uh, four. And we said in one type of problem, the inlet conditions, the flow rate and the compositions will be given. So we'll have six equations and six unknowns. We went further and said, OK, I'm going to get rid of all the y's and reduce it into three equations and three unknowns. When I do that, I get this nice tridiagonal structure. So it's a linear problem. And if you give me what x0 is, y4 is, and l, v, and k, I can calculate what s is, because s is nothing but l divided by kv. Okay? So everything on the right-hand side is known. So that is called a forcing term. So the system is being forced from what happens at the input. And what my goal is to predict what happens in the output. What is the exit concentration here? in both the gas and the liquid. But the way I have formulated here, I will actually get more than that. I will get x1, I will get x2, and I will get x3, even though I'm interested only in x3. But I'm interested in y1. I don't have y1 here. How would I get y1? In this equation that I have formulated, the model I have formulated, I don't have y1. Yeah. y1 equals? It, with x1, y1 equals kx1, y1 equals kx1. These are the equations we eliminated. Okay, we use that equation to get rid of all the y1, y2, and y3. So you can back calculate. If you want y1, once you have solved for x1, you can put the x1 here and calculate y1. Those are process type of calculations that you should be able to understand and do. Okay. So our task now is to construct this 3 by 3 matrix for a particular given problem. The problem you are given is compute solution, computer solution for this particular set. L equal to 1, V equal to 1, K equal to 2, X0 equal to 0.1, and Y4 equal to 0. Find X1, X2, X3, and Y1. How do I do that in MATLAB? Okay. So one way of doing that is, let me just clear all the workspaces. Oops. Clear, clear the window. And you can also clear the command history. Okay, so I have a blank slate, and I guess I should change the path to where I have the lecture. Okay, okay. so I wanted to define what L is. So L is given as one. Do you know what happens when I put a semicolon after that? <coughs> it defines the variable, but it doesn't print it out. If I put, for example, v equal to 1 and don't put this semicolon, it will print out. Okay? It interprets that line and executes it. And in this case, the execution is just assigning a value of 1 to v. And k was equal to also 1, I think. I need to switch between these two. Oh, k is equal to 2. Okay? You can just reset it, k equal to 2. Okay. As I do that, you will see on the right-hand side, these variables are all defined for me. Okay. And then S is equal to L divided by K divided by V. Okay. And I'm going to suppress the output also. So I now define S. Now, what is T? I have a very poor memory. So <laughs> the matrix T is 1 plus S, 1, minus 1, and then minus S, 1 plus S, etc. So I'm going to <coughs> input this matrix manually. Okay, and then we will see how to generalize that. Okay? So as we said earlier, T is equal to 1 plus S, first element, space, and then minus 1, 0, semicolon. In the next row, I have minus S, 1 plus S, uh, minus 1. Correct? Correct me if I make a mistake. Okay? The third one is 0. Uh, minus s, 1 plus s. Typical mistakes you will make would be leaving out the space between two numbers. Okay? Then MATLAB would interpret it as an incorrect expression because it doesn't know what to do. Okay? So, so s has been defined as a number, so that substitution for s has taken place, and I get this tridiagonal matrix in this particular form. 
okay and i need to define now the right hand side vector okay so how do i define the right hand side vector it is simply b is equal to s times x naught but did i define x naught not yet okay so i need to define that x naught is equal to uh, what was the value 0.1 0 0.1 okay and y 4 is equal to 0 now you should remember the difference between arrays and variables okay if i had entered it as y parenthesis 4 that would be treated as a fourth element in an array y okay but if i write it as y4 it's just a variable okay it's not an array okay so now i have defined x0 and uh, uh, y4 i can define b b is equal to s times x0 space 0 space y4 divided by k and finish it okay so this is going to now define a row vector but i really want a column vector so i'm going to put the transpose operator okay now i get a column vector so to answer that question all i need to do now in matlab is x is equal to t backslash b it immediately calls the gaussian elimination solves the system of three equations and produces the result in x that is my x value x1 x2 x3 okay what i'm really interested in what i asked you is just the exit composition <coughs> okay the exit composition x3 but i have more than that i have x1 x2 and x3 okay and to calculate y1 all i need to do is cal uh, put y1 as equal to k times x1 do you understand what i did there I did not put, for example, y1 equal to kx1. If I had done that, what would I get? Error. error. What, what would be the error? x1 is undefined. Okay. So x is an array, and I have to take the first element in that and multiply it by k, and that will give me y1. So I have solved that particular problem. Okay. Now, this is a very tedious way of doing it, because if you have every problem and you need to actually type in, so it is better to write something called a script file, which is a file into which you put all these commands. Okay? And the best way to learn MATLAB, at least the way that I do, is I play with it on the command window. I see whether I get everything right approximately. Then I can write the code so that I can change the code, just one line, and redo the problem for parametric cases, for example. So the, all the commands that I have entered are actually stored in the command history. So I can go there and select each one of them. I think that you have to press the control button and highlight each one of them. The ones that I need, okay? T. I guess I need all of them. <laughs> okay? So I have selected all the commands. I guess I missed. Okay. Right click and it will give you a set of menus and one of them is create a script file. Okay. So you say create a script file and all the commands that you have entered in the history becomes a file. You can save this file now. Okay. And then for example, uh, you are dealing with uh, vapor rate of 3. All you have to do is just change that number and run that file, you will get the new result for that particular case. So it's really very powerful. So you have to save this now. So I can say save as, it is saving in the same directory and I will give it as test.m for example. This is not a function file. What is the difference between function file and script file? You must have seen this in 2160. Remember? No? A script file is a file that contains any valid MATLAB command. Okay? And you can execute it very easily. Okay? So how do you execute it? Once you, you can also choose to open up the editor in MATLAB. How do you do that? You just go to the command line and say edit test2.m, for example. So it's using the edit command to open a new file. Okay. And it says it doesn't exist. You want to create it? Yes. So this is your editor window. So I have two files here, test.m, which is blank, and test.m, which I created from the command history using the generate code uh, option. It generates the script file. Okay? So 
to run this, I, all I need to do is there is a green button there. If I click that, it's going to execute all the commands at once and then give me the result, okay, in the command window. The results will come in the command window. So before I do that, let me just show you that we really it is this one that is producing. So let me clear the workspace, clear the command window, and then go to the, and then run. Okay, what it has done is, is it has executed every one of those commands, and if you go to the workspace, all those variables will be defined again for you, and the result is there. Okay, make sense? Am I going too slow? Okay. Um, that is a script file. Script file doesn't have a functional structure. It doesn't take any input. It doesn't produce any specific output. But every variable that you define in a script file is global in scope. That's another concept. Have you seen the variable? What is the idea between global variable and local variables in 2160? No? So there is a lot of MATLAB learning in this course then for you guys. A global variable is a variable that are, is available in the workspace. So whenever you define a variable in the command window, it becomes global in scope and a copy of it is put into the workspace. So any, you can reuse it any number of times that you want. But a function is also a file, okay? But a function file has a very specific meaning, okay? So in this particular example, I'm going to create <laughs> edit trid.m. The next part of the question, maybe let's go to the question and see what we are asked to do. Uh, so the first part is done. Okay, switch to MATLAB and we have so solved and we have obtained the compositions and uh, the Y1. Now generalize, that is, problem is, as a process engineer, you're wearing the head of a process engineer now, find the number of stages that is needed to reduce the composition to 0. 0.0005. Okay, so in the inlet liquid stream, you have an in inlet composition of 0.1, and when you had three stages, that composition was reduced to 0 0.0067. The inlet concentration was 0.1, the exit concentration in the liquid phase was reduced to 0 0.0067. But that's not enough. Environmental restrictions say you cannot discharge that stream into the river, for example. So you need to reduce it to 0 0.0001. As a process engineer, you need to say, okay, what can I do? Okay, there are a number of options that you can have in your hand. One is to increase the vapor rate, okay, so that I get more of this into the vapor phase. The other one is to increase the number of stages. So these will have consequences in terms of your operating cost and capital cost. If I increase the number of stages, it's going to increase the initial capital cost because I need to build a tower which has not three stages, but five stages or seven stages. But if you say, okay, I want to do this only with three stages, I want to minimize my capital cost, then you need to put more vapor in through it. So on a daily basis, that's your operating cost, okay? So the ultimate design is an optimization problem where we try to minimize the total cost, operating cost versus capital cost, okay? These things you will learn in the design course, et cetera, but you're seeing the basic idea of how you can use MATLAB to answer at least some of those questions. So I'll, if, I, if my task is to reduce it to less than 0 0.001, how can I achieve that by uh, changing the number of stages? Do you understand the question? How do you do, how do you go about doing that? When you change the number of stages, what happens to the problem size? Instead of a three by three, I have four by four or five by five or seven by seven, I don't know what it is, I need to find that out, okay? So what that means is, I need to solve this problem repeatedly by writing out the three by three matrix and the four by four matrix and the five by five matrix, et cetera. That's tedious. So how can we use MATLAB to help us in that problem so that we can get to the answer quickly? That's the goal now, okay? So I need to write a function which will generate the tridiagonal matrix for any value of n that I give, okay? So that's my goal. So I'm going to go into the... Uh, today create that matrix. Yeah, edit trid.m. So this is the function I'm creating. I hit enter and, oops. Yeah, I already have that function. I guess I should get rid of this and we'll write it from scratch, okay? So we are going to write a new function. I'm going to do it with your help, okay? The 
structure of a function that is different from a script is it must always start with the keyword function. That's how MATLAB knows this is a function, it's not a script. That means it has a whole set of attributes associated with it. Any variable that I use inside the function is local. The moment I get out of the function, those values will be forgotten. It will not be available in the workspace. Okay? So it gives you a nice way to isolate so that you don't reuse accidentally the same variable in different parts. So the function is the keyword that I need, and it's going to produce one output. So the next, I, sh I need a space, and then I need to identify all the outputs that function is going to produce equal to uh, the name that you can give. Parenthesis, you identify what are the inputs. Okay? I'm going to identify L, <coughs> D, U, comma, N. So what I'm saying here is I'm going to input four numbers. Well, I want you to do it differently so that you just don't copy this and submit it. Okay? I want you to do, do it differently in your assignment. You're going to do essentially the similar part for the second problem. But here I'm taking four inputs. The first input is all the numbers that go onto the lower diagonal. The second one is all the elements that go on the diagonal. The third one is all the elements that go on the upper diagonal. And n is actual size of the matrix. Okay? So that is how I start writing a function. Okay? Then um, what would I do next? I would. You you can here you can put a comment. That's a very good practice that he suggests. Okay, so you, here you can say this calculates the tridiagonal matrix, and you can identify what the inputs are. L is the lower diagonal elements, etc. You get the idea. You can put u, what is u, you can put what is d, you can put what is n, number of stages, etc. And then you leave a space. Okay. So when somebody asks, when somebody has access to this function and say, help trid, they are going to get this part, the first part of the program, as the help. That's how MATLAB provides help on any function that you are using that's built in. Okay. Next thing is I need to construct this matrix T. And how can I do that? Here, as I said earlier, if you know, if you are already a good programmer, you can just write that function directly. But if you don't know, you need to figure out how to do it for the first time. You need to say, OK, how can I do this in a general fashion? I can go to the MATLAB environment and figure out how to do that. Okay. So one of the functions that you will find, pardon me? Did, did you need a question? <laughs> oh, oh. You, you don't have to write it down. Don't worry. <laughs> it, it, the recorded version of it is there. And uh, number of stages. My typo is also there. <laughs> Sorry. OK. <clears throat> so can we do what we did in the previous part? I can say t is equal to. Uh, 1 plus s, would you advise that I do that? Because you don't know how many rows you have to, how many elements in the first row you need to put. You don't know how many rows you need because that depends on n. So that strategy is not going to work. Okay? So you need to abandon that and you need to figure out a more elegant way of constructing this matrix for any value of n. And one of the commands that you have in MATLAB is called zeros. You must have seen this in MATLAB uh, 2160, right? What does zeros do? Yeah, if I create zeros three, creates a three by zeros. Okay, three by three matrix. If I do zeros three comma one, it creates a column vector. If I put comma zero zeros one comma three, it will produce a row vector. So you have an idea of how to produce a column of zeros. There is a similar function called ones, which just produces one. Okay, so I could do, for example, I can define n is equal to seven. Because n is defined coming into the function. Okay? For illustration purposes here, I'm defining n equal to 7. I can say, for example, once 1 comma n and multiply it by d. I guess I should define what d is. d is the diagonal element equals uh, 1 plus s. Okay? So I've defined d because d is going to come into the function with a number. So I can say uh, 
once uh, 1 comma n times d. What do you think it will produce? A vector of length 7 with d in that, the value of d. Okay? And then <coughs> there is another function called diag. What does diag do? Let's see. Diag ends. What do you think this is going to do? What is ANS? ANS is the variable that I just computed and Diag takes that vector and creates a matrix of the same size 7 by 7, puts that element in the diagonal, all those numbers in the diagonal. Do you understand what's happened? With this clue now, you help me. How would I write that first statement? I have to use these two functions. Okay, So I can say t is equal to Diag. So Diag will expect a vector and that vector is created by once, very good, multiplied by d. So parenthesis matched and everything is fine. So now n can, I can change n value to anything. It will automatically create a matrix T with the right elements on D as defined by D. So D is also an input. So you must notice that D is an input that is used here, N is an input that is used here. Anything that appears on the right hand side of a statement must be defined before, either as an input coming into the function or by calculation. Okay. Now if I stop this, what is going to happen? It will produce an output which is a Diagonal matrix. So let, let me save it and let me show you how I would use it. So I go to the MATLAB session and say TRI, well, let me just say first help TRID. It produces the first four lines of comment that I put. To execute it, I say TRID and I put uh, 1, 2, 3, 7. What do you think it's going to do? Is it going to produce an error? That's one option. We'll examine that. Any other suggestion? There was some other suggestion. What is it? Yeah. What will it do? It will produce it? Okay, that's another suggestion. This is an important process of learning. Okay, when you're writing this, you anticipate. You say, okay, what, what is MATLAB? This is how you understand MATLAB, okay? What is it going to do? You may be completely wrong, but you learn why you are wrong when you see what it actually does, okay? And that's an important part of learning. Uh, be bold to project what it's going to do. Any other suggestions? Be bold, I said. <laughs> no? Nobody wants to guess? Okay, let's just hit the return button and see what it does and see whether it makes sense. What did it do? <coughs> Produced a square 7 by 7 matrix with elements only in the diagonal. Even though I defined L and U, I never used it inside the function. What I used inside the function is only D, the diagonal. Okay, so it produces the diagonal part. Do you understand what happened? Now you need to come up with a way of fixing it because you want to go, there is a goal that you want to achieve. That is you want to produce a tridiagonal matrix. This doesn't do. But it, you have already a powerful tool because this can produce a matrix of any size. If you put 20, it will produce a 20 by 20 matrix with diagonals. But it ignores L and U. In fact, if you look carefully, it gives you a warning. It highlights the L and U. And if you take the cursor near it, it says input argument U might be unused. So you're passing something into the function but it, you're not using it, you're not doing anything with it. So it I, I automatically gives you clues like that. Okay? Do you understand it? Any questions? If not, what do I do next? You add the upper part and you add the lower part. So this is matrix addition. Okay? But let me go to the MATLAB window and ask the question, what would I get if I say diag? Now, diag has two input arguments, 
Okay, so that, um, as I type, in fact, if you hold on, it tells you diag v comma k. So it can take two input arguments. Diag is a function, it takes two input arguments. So if I say, for example, diag five comma one, what does it do? <coughs> What did it do? <laughs> well, okay, what I really wanted to do, I, I think it, it is working in the same way, but it is the one here says put the elements in the upper diagonal part, okay? So to really see that, I should do, for example, diag uh, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, comma 1. So what I'm saying is put those numbers, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, there are five numbers I have but put them above the diagonal. The second argument, one says, put them above the diagonal. So you get all the numbers five assigned to upper diagonal one. If you want to do the lower diagonal one, can you kind of guess? Negative one. Okay. Now, if I want to put them all together, diagonal, upper diagonal, and lower diagonal, what do I do? So I need to add diag, okay, once, one comma n, come multiplied by L, comma minus one. I, I have a deliberate error here, I want to see who captures that, okay. Diag one comma n, multiplied by u, comma plus one. This is not deliberate. I'm just trying to fix once. Okay. What have I done? If you look carefully, can you see in the back? Is that good one? Yes. Okay. So the first one we saw what it did. Second one I'm adding once. This is not one. This is L. This is L that comes in from the input. Okay. So I'm creating a vector of once, multiplying it by L, and putting it into the lower diagonal element by saying the second argument is minus 1. And I'm doing the same thing. I said there is an error in there. What is that error? It's going to create, whatever n value is, that's going to create how many numbers are in that diagonal. So we give you an extra row. That's right. So there is a dimensional inconsistency in the problem because what it does is on the diagonal, if there are seven elements, on the off-diagonal elements, how much does it have? Only six. Okay. So if you give seven, then it's going to create an eight by eight matrix. So in the second and third elements of that function, it will create and actually end up creating an eight. The result of this would be an eight by eight matrix if n is equal to seven. And then you're saying add that to a seven by seven matrix. It's not going to work. It will give you an error message. How do we fix that? And minus one. Okay. Now you save that, and you go to the MATLAB window, and type that function. Type simply list that function. Okay. So type T R I A. What did I call it? T R I. So that is a function that I wrote. Okay, I'm listing it with the type command. I can ask for help. That gives you the front. I can now execute it. How do I execute it? I just say T R I D uh, one comma two comma minus one comma six. So what is this going to produce? A six by six matrix with ones on the lower diagonal, twos on the diagonal and minus one on the upper diagonal. There it is. But the beauty of this is I can go back and say change it to 60. It's going to produce a 60 by 60 matrix. You don't have to write it down and solve. I have 60 stages. Okay, That's where the power really comes in in generalization. Of course, it's a huge matrix. <laughs> so it just goes over very quickly. Any questions on that? Is that okay? Now, this is a function. This function can be reused any number of times. 
we haven't still solved the problem. What is the problem? The problem is find me that number of stages which reduces the concentration to point zero 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 one, something like that, right? Zero zero five. I wanted to reduce it to point zero zero five. Okay, how many stages do I need? How would I answer that question using this tool now? The function that I have built. You can use a while statement. Keep incrementing n and solving the problem repeatedly. Okay, it's a very good idea. I have not done that. I'm going to illustrate something different, but that's actually a very good idea. Okay, I'm just going to select two or three n's and then show you how to do that. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to now write a script file. I think this maybe I can save some time by showing you what the script file looks like. Uh, no, that's not the script file I want. Problem. Remember, the difference between a script file and the function file is function file has definite inputs and outputs and function as the keyword. A script file is anything that you can type on the command window, you can throw it into a file. So this is a script file. So let's now try to understand what the script file does. What does it do on line one? It defines all the values that are given to me. k equal to 2, l equal to 1, v equal to 1, s equal to l over kv. I'm calculating it. And x0 equal to 0.1. Okay? And what am I doing in the second line? I'm solving it for n equal to 3 because I've already done it. I want to make sure that it works. So for n equal to 3, I'm constructing a tridiagonal matrix, but I'm calling it as T3 matrix. I'm not calling it simply as T, but T3 to indicate to me that it's a 3 by 3 matrix. And then try D. I put minus S, comma, S plus 1, comma, minus 1, comma, N. So this actually defines the lower diagonal and upper diagonal, the four inputs and the number, number of stages. So that is going to return in my workspace a new variable called T3, which will be a 3 by 3 matrix for three stages. And then the next part, what do I do? I define, now you can write these one below the other if that helps you in understanding it. But MATLAB allows you to stack all the lines horizontally also, putting semicolon, okay? But you can do this as well. <coughs> Okay, and then I'm solving for x3 equals t3 backslash b3. Okay. So the try matrix shouldn't be t3 Thank you. I just in rearranging it. I just deleted the t. So t3 b3 and x3 equals t3 backslash b3. Remember, as you're writing it, everything on the right hand side must be calculated or defined before. Okay. So <coughs> that's done. And then all I've done is I've copied that line one more time and changed n to 7. This is exactly the same line that I had before. I, of course, I changed it to t7 and then b7. Okay. So if I run the script, I will get solutions for two different cases. One when n equal to 3, another one when n equal to 7. How do I run this? All I have to do is just run that, hit the green button, and it runs and it defines all these variables globally in the workspace. So if I go to the command window, you will see T3 defined, T7 defined, and X3 defined, and X7 defined. Okay? And if you want to look at what the values are, of course here it prints out. So when you have seven stages, does it meet the re requirement? It does. 0. 0.0004 is the exit concentration. What I wanted it was only 0 0.005, I think. So 7 is actually too many, perhaps. So now you need to bracket it. You can say, OK, maybe I should try for 6. Maybe I should try for 5. And that's where using the while loop becomes extremely elegant. You just put a while loop and say, until the x composition, the last composition, the last number in the x vector becomes less than 0 0.005, keep doing it. Do you want to try that as a group of two or three people? Figure out the code, and then we will do it on the screen. How many of you are comfortable with the while loop? Only one or two. <laughs> we need some leaders here and there. <clears throat> OK. As I said, I've not done this, so help me. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. 
That's how you learn. You make mistakes, but you understand where the mistakes are, and you learn from that. Okay. So I want to implement the suggestion that he made in a script file. How would I do that? While. While. What is that condition statement? Right. So the, the, the first thing I need to do is I need to kind of initialize, okay, n is equal to 3. So I'm going to start from exploring three stages, four stages, five stages, and stop exactly when the condition is met. Okay, so let me get rid of all these commands. Okay, and what you need to, this is a thought process because you're writing the code. Since he asked the question, I'm writing it fresh also. Okay, so we need to go through the process of what it is that we need to impose as a condition. While requires a condition. Until that condition is uh, met, it's going to execute whatever is inside that loop. Okay, so I will have a condition, and then inside that I will have some statements, and then I will have an end statement. Okay, that is the structure of the while loop. Okay, so what is the condition? The condition is I want the exit composition to be greater than 0 0.0005. Until that's met, I want it to do the calculations. Okay, So I need to pick that variable. So how am I going to do that? I, I, I need to define again that variable, x last, for example, the last composition is equal to 1. And then I can say when x last is greater than 0 0.0005. As long as the last composition from the stage is greater than 0 0.0005, keep doing it. Do what? <laughs> okay? If I make a mistake, please correct me, okay? Do what? Do the calculations, right? Increment n. So I have n, n, n equal to 3. Uh, so I need a statement n is equal to n plus 1. I need to increment n continuously, okay? And I put, so maybe I want to change this to n equal to 2. Okay. So the first time it does it is going to do it actually for three stages. What do, what should be the next state? Uh, so I have defined n. Okay, n is can, can be three, four, five. I have set up a place where n automatically increments. Am I going fast? Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So what do I do next? Then you will create your matrix. T equals uh, T or ID and minus S, S plus <coughs> 1, comma, minus 1, comma, N. So N is now automatically being changed. All the others remain constant. Okay, so that's fine. And then I need to calculate B. B is the right hand side. Okay, so that's going to be S times X0, which remains constant, and then zeros n minus 1, comma 1, and that's it. Why did I do that? Can you explain what I've done there? Do you understand that statement? This statement creates a random cipher. Random cipher must be of length n. Okay. So the first element is s so I'm creating a column there. And then zeros n minus 1. The remaining are all n minus 1, including the y n plus 1, the last one, is 0 in this case. The entering entering vapor composition is 0. Okay, So all the elements in B are 0. And that's why I included it uh, in one vector instead of having it separately, as we did when we did the 3 by 3 case. So I have constructed T. I have constructed B. What do I do next? X is equal to? T backslash B. Wouldn't you more value for B, y, that, that, that's what I was trying to explain. Because that last element is always zero in this case, I included it by <laughs> that will produce the same thing. <clears throat> now is it clear? If that's not clear, it's not clear. Okay. This is the right hand side vector, right? Sx0 and then 0000 for everything except for the last one. 
So if I have to write this properly in this way, what I should do, maybe let's do it that way and then understand why this will work. So I must have n minus two zeros, right? Because the first one is non-zero, the last one is non-zero, everything else is zero, right? So I need n minus two zeros there. And then the last one would be semicolon, the y entering value, okay? So in this particular case, it was y4 because I had three stages. But if I had eight stages, that would be numbered as y9. If I had 20 stages, that would be numbered as y21, etc. Okay? But that number is always zero in this particular problem. Okay? So I need to put a zero in the last place also. Okay? So I, I can put an explicit zero. Or I can say this is y last divided by k, but then I need to define y last as equal to 0. They will all do the same thing. But if I write it like this, I gain some power. What is the power? For example, if the last composition is not 0, if it's something else, all I have to do is go to the first line and change that value, and I can make it work. Okay? Any questions? Now, is this program going to work? Wouldn't have to use x sub n because it's going to keep going for every n until the value See, uh, yeah, excellent, excellent. I have a bad habit. If somebody answers a question, I assume everybody understands it. There is an important element that you need to do still, one last part. Otherwise, everything else has been put in place. And that last part is the length of the vector x keeps increasing as n increases. And what we want is to take the last value of that element, okay? Because that's what I'm going to compare in the line x last equals 0 0.005. So I can do x last is equal to x n. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the last element of the vector and putting it into a variable called x last. When this function goes back, it will do it for, for example, the very first time it comes through, it's going to step and then increment it and then it will solve for the k by k system. <coughs> Excuse me. And it will take x3, put it into the variable called x last, and then goes back. Now x last is no longer 1. It has a new value. And is that value greater than 0 0.0005? The answer is s. I need to do one more stage. Okay, then I will increment n, do 4 by 4, and I take x4 and put it into x last. Right? Do you understand, everybody? So, I save this, I guess I can get rid of that line, right, it's useless. Okay, save this, and then it's still a script file, okay, a script file, you can always run it from this command, but you won't know what it does because it's going to print out a lot of things on the command window. So it executed the whole thing, came out of the win solution, but <clears throat> it printed out a lot of them. Okay, why did it do that? X last equals one, B equals three, four. You can see it: five, six, seven. So it did seven times. So n equal to seven, it met that condition. But we have no output. The program is not structured in such a way that it produces meaningful outputs. So now we can clean it up. You have made the logic work. You can clean up the program to suppress, for example, all the outputs. So you can go in there and put a semicolon there, a semicolon there to suppress that output. And then you want to print out. What do you want to print out? N. Because you want to know how many stages. So you just type N. It will print out the value of N. Okay. So run that, and then it says n equal to 7. Okay, So this is the power of this method is now you can go into the function and say, no, I really want to reduce this to 0. 0.00005. Just change that, and it, it, it let it do all the calculations. Okay, Run it again, and go there. It says 14 stages. You need 14 stages to reduce the composition to that level. Okay, So you can, be, I hope you begin to see the power of using a language like this where you can answer more sophisticated process design related questions. Any questions on that? 
Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> so I've done the second question and seen more importantly the ideas behind implementing the problem in the MATLAB language. The third question is an alternate specification. What is an alternate specification? Remember, we have 10 variables and 6 equations to begin with, and so we have 4 degrees of freedom. So any of the 4 variables that are appearing in the model can be specified. And that depends on what kind of a process situation you are examining. So in this particular case, you are told that you are processing a certain amount of gas, V, <coughs> and you are told what is the inlet composition in the liquid stream, and you are told that the composition Y4 must be reduced to Y1. So you're, in this case, you are switching two of the specifications. Instead of previously specifying L, you are making L as the unknown. <coughs> but we are specifying Y1. Previously, you were calculating Y1. Okay? So we are just, we have two sets of variables, and we are switching. Okay? Switch L with Y1. Make Y1 unknown and make L an unknown. So you will still have six equations and six unknowns. You can still go through the elimination process, reduce it to three equations and three unknowns. But what will be the unknowns? <clears throat> okay, so here is a map. So let me identify all the things that have been specified. V has been specified. Y4 has been specified. Y1 has been specified. And X0 has been specified. Four degrees of freedom have been exhausted. Okay, now I need to find out what are the ones that I need to calculate. What are the unknowns? The unknowns are L, X1, X2, X3, Y2, Y3. <coughs> Okay, I have six unknowns, I have six equations, but I can eliminate those three variables. What are the variables I want to eliminate? <coughs> Previously, we eliminated y1, y2, y3, but now I cannot eliminate y1. Why? It is already known. Okay, so I can only eliminate the unknown variable. So I can eliminate y2 and y3. <coughs> okay, but if I know y1, do I know x1? This is not MATLAB questions. These are process questions. Okay, so now you are a chemical engineer. Okay, so if I know y1, y1 and x1 are related. I can immediately calculate x1. So I actually also know x1. <coughs> okay, so in the unknown list, all I need to include is the vector x is going to contain L, which is the solvent rate. How much of solvent do I need to use to reduce the composition from y4 to composition y1? How much of solvent do I need? That's a question I'm answering as a process engineer. Okay, and then what will I include in the unknown? <coughs> X2 and X3. Of course, you also have Y2 and Y3 is unknown, but once you know X2 and X3, you can calculate Y2 and Y3 using Y equals KX idea. <coughs> okay, so what I have is I have same problem, same model. By simply changing the specification, I'm addressing a different type of process scenario. And in here, L and X2 and X3 are unknown, and these are the three equations that you see here. They are the same equations, just arranged. Everything has been moved to the left-hand side, and I've written that as equal to zero. And <coughs> remember, here, I know V, I know K, and I know, I don't know L, I know K, I know X naught. So everything that is known is still appearing on the left-hand side, okay? And uh, what else? L is not known, K is known, Y1 is known, and X1, X1 is known but it has been eliminated already, okay? <coughs> so Y1 appears, that is known, Y1 appears there, that's known. So the only thing that you will have as unknowns would be L, X2, and X3, every other symbol that appears in those three same equations are known quantities. Okay, So we have once again three equations and three unknowns. Question to you is, is it linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear. Why do you say that? What makes it nonlinear? That's a very important thing for you to be able to do because can you use a tridiagonal matrix formalism to construct the matrix T and B and get a solution to this problem? This is the same process, but a different question you are trying to answer. What is the solvent that I need? Okay, so L becomes an unknown. Okay.
Okay, so if you look at the unknown, L is an unknown, X2 is an unknown, X3 is an unknown. Okay. <coughs> These are all the unknowns. And Y4, of course, is known. I should highlight that. Y4 is known, K is known. So in that equation, I have highlighted what are the ones that are known and what are the ones that are unknown. How do I know whether this is a linear or a nonlinear problem? Simple test. Find two unknowns. If they appear linearly, meaning only as additives, x2 plus x3 or x2 minus x3, then it's linear. But if there is a product of the two unknowns anywhere, or if there is a sine or cosine or exponential in the unknown, that makes it nonlinear. Then you need to use a different tool in MATLAB to solve that. Okay. So in this case, <coughs> let's take term by term to, uh, to apply the test. This term is a linear term. This term is a linear term because L is only appearing by itself. It's not appearing as a product. Okay. So this is a linear term. That is a linear term. But what about this? That is a nonlinear term because L is unknown. X2 is unknown. You have a product. Okay. And similarly, this is a nonlinear term in the equation. But these equations are all coupled. All you need is a nonlinear term in one term in one equation that makes the entire set nonlinear. Okay. So the tool that you use once you detect that it is a nonlinear problem, the tool that you use is called FSOL. <coughs> it's a built-in function. Just like backslash operator is a tool that inverts the matrix and multiplies it and gives you the solution, FSOL tries to find the solution for a nonlinear problem. Have you ever solved a nonlinear problem before in any course? I'm sure you have. Polynomials are nonlinear terms, right? How do you do with polynomials? <clears throat> what does a solution to a nonlinear equation mean? Finding those values which make the function go to zero. Exactly. So here I have three functions. Okay. Those functions I have labeled them as f1, f2, and f3. And there are three variables, l, x2, and x3. So my task is to find the guess for each one of those three variables so that all the three equations simultaneously go to zero. Okay. In one dimensional case, it's easy to understand what does it mean if I have a function f of x as equal to x cubed plus sine of x equal to zero. Find me a solution. That's a nonlinear problem. Find me a solution means find me that value of x that makes the function equal to zero. It's very easy to do. All you do is plot f of x versus x. Pick a range of numbers for x. Generate the values for the function. Plot them. Okay. If the function looks like that, you know that is a solution, that is a solution. A nonlinear equation can have more than one solution. A linear equation can have only one unique solution. Okay? A nonlinear problem can have many solutions that satisfy that condition. So in our case, solving a nonlinear problem means finding repeatedly guesses for three variables, x, l, x2, and x3, and finding which one of those values will make those three functions equal to zero. If you do that by hand, you can be doing it for days and days without getting the solution. Okay? So a clever way would be, and we will see the algorithms for how it actually <laughs> does it in the second half of the course. But all we want to do now is how to formulate the problem, how to solve it using computers. So how does FSOL solve it? How do I use this function FSOL to be able to solve nonlinear problems? That is the question we are going to answer. Okay? Any question on what task we have at hand? We have, three, we have identified three equations and three unknowns. We have identified that these are nonlinear because there are products of the unknowns. Now I need to develop a way where I provide three guesses for L, X2, and X3. I guess for each one of those variables and then calculate what that function is and keep repeatedly doing it until I find all the three functions to be equal to zero. <coughs> so I already know how to write a function. Okay. So again, in the interest of saving time, I'm going to open up that function not going to write that function in front of you. So here is a function. Okay. What does this function do? It takes one vector x. What does that vector contain? That vector contains the three values. The first value is a guess for L. The second value is a guess for x2. And the third value is a guess for x3, etc. Okay. So the vector x contains these three numbers as it comes into the function. Okay, and <coughs> it calculates three functions and returns those three functions. Okay, so 
here I have comment as a help and then first meaningful line here is number seven. What does seven do? What am I trying to do in line seven? I know that x vector that comes in is going to have three values and I know that the first value stands for first element of vector x which is x1 stands for L. So I'm just taking that x1, the first element, putting it to a variable called L because that is a guess for L. Then I define k equals to 2, v equal to 1, x0, 0, 0 y4 is 0.8. These are all given to me. Okay, y4 is given, remember, and y1 is given. These are all given. I'm just defining those variables. So line 10 is the next important line. What does that do? It states that function f. I want to calculate that function okay, using those values. So if you go back, there is your function f1. v times k times x2 minus y1 minus l times y1 over k minus x0. That's not going to be 0 for any arbitrary guesses for l, x2, and x3. Okay. So all I want to do is calculate those function values, knowing that it's not going to be 0. Okay. So f1 is equal to that, f2 is equal to that, f3 is equal to that. That's my function. Now it's MATLAB's job to repeatedly call this function, maybe 100 times, maybe 1,000 times, putting different guesses for x. That, that means for l, x2, and x3. Okay. And get the value that it gets back from this function, and examine, am I going closer to 0? Is this the direction I should change for L or X2? Which direction will take me to 0? There's a sophisticated algorithm in FSOL that does that. Any questions? Again, this is a very powerful and important idea. If the concept is not clear, please put up your hand and ask me. How many, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So the way I'm going to use this function is put three numbers into x vector and pass it with the understanding the first array position has a guess for L. So all I'm doing in this line is taking that number and putting it to L. Okay? Let me run that and show you what happens. Okay? So how would I use this function? I have written a function. So I can create a vector x oops, as equal to three numbers. The first number is going to be 1.2, for example. That's going to stand for a guess for L. The second one is going to be 0.2. Third one is going to be 0.1. These are guesses for X2 and X3. So I've defined this variable. Only I know the meaning of it. MATLAB doesn't care. For MATLAB, just three numbers. Okay. And then I'm going to call, uh, let me show you another feature of MATLAB. You can set up something called breakpoints so that when the control comes to the function, you can stop. For example, I can stop here. By clicking on that line, puts a red dot there. So when I call this function, p2 non, I guess we are running out of time, p2 n o n l x. This is how I would execute the function. Okay? So it's going to take those three numbers defined in x and say, OK, pass it on to p2 n o n l, the file, the function file. And you do the calculations, and I expect three numbers back. Okay, <coughs> So when I hit that, the control goes to that function. And inside the function, I have set up a breakpoint. So before it executes the line, it stops. Okay. If I didn't stand, set up the breakpoint, it will go through all the calculations and give me three numbers. Those three numbers will be function values f1, f2, f3. But to answer your question, if I look at, for example, what is contained in x, it gives me 1.2, 0.2.1 in the vector x. That's what I sent it. Okay. And then I can execute one line at a time. For example, if I go there and say step, it has executed line 7. Now I ask the question, what is value in L? L has 1.2, the first value. Okay, <clears throat> And what is the value of V? It is still not defined because it has not executed that line. Okay, So if I execute the next line, then all these get defined. L, K, V, etc. Now F is not defined yet. Okay, If I execute the next line, F1 is calculated. So F now will be a number which is not equal to 0. I want that to be equal to 0. Okay? But that function is not equal to 0 based on those guesses. And I go through one more time, one more time, and I, I come out. When I come out, the control goes back to the MATLAB session. So that returns three numbers. None of them are 0. That means my guesses are 
terrible. Now I can say, okay, I'm going to change these guesses until I get them to zero. You can be doing this forever, you, even though you have the function. Okay? And FSOL will get us there in an instant. We'll see that how, how it's done in the next class. <coughs>